Network Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, December 1st, and here are some of the stories we are covering. African economies are challenged to explore alternative ways to recover from multiple shocks. We live in an Africa where almost every country is struggling from these new shocks. So managing an African economy at this time is one of the most difficult. The East African community proposes to extend the deadline for a single currency to 2031. Nigeria's president says the Ukraine war is bringing arms and fighters into the Lake Chad Basin. Chadian lawyers demand the release of over 400 pro-democracy detainees. It will be a parody of justice because everything is in violation of all the rules of procedure. And therefore, we as lawyers cannot endorse you. That's why you say the arrested person must be just free. And on this World is Day, today, Thursday, we will have a report on the impact of the disease on South African girls and young women. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. African economies are being urged to include food security, climate change mitigation, and adaptation in their economic agenda. The topic was discussed at a conference in Nairobi, Kenya, where governments across the continent focused on protecting private investments and recovering health infrastructure, education, and nutrition as a way of reviving growth after multiple shocks. Maureen Ojiambo reports. Recovery measures dominated the conversation during the 57th biannual African Economies Research Conference, a three-day meeting that ended on Wednesday. Participants urged governments to develop, regulate, and even protect the markets as part of economic recovery. Kenya's Cabinet Secretary for National Treasury and Economic Planning, Juguna Ndungu, challenged researchers to focus on resolutions that include the mobilization of domestic resources and the use of digital technologies in Africa's recovery plans. He says, Africa's economic recovery can be accelerated with collaborative research that focuses on inviting investment. And also back home in the Horn of Africa is the drought situation which has become extremely, extremely pervasive. We need to consider food security and climate change in the midst of our development agenda. We have to look at what issues do we need to look at in terms of mitigation and adaptation and creating appropriate resilience. In the last two decades, African economies have endured multiple global shocks. The chairperson of African Economies Research Conference Board, Anis Tayete, says the COVID-19 pandemic together with the war in Ukraine and the climate-related shocks could take years for the economy to recover. We live in an Africa where almost every country is struggling really from these new shocks. Apart from these uh, global shocks that uh, we uh, get accustomed to, almost every single country in the region has its own fair share of uh, local shocks. Some of it driven by local politics, some of it driven by various other things like ethnicity and other things. So managing an African economy at this time is one of the most difficult things. On the other hand, African Economies Research Conference Acting Executive Director Director Theophil Azomaho says the economic fundamentals of most African economies have not changed much over the last three decades despite new challenges. This is a literal recovery from multiple shocks indeed, both internally and externally. Externally because COVID-19 came knocking and the economy literally slowed down. Most of our programs were affected. This outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic did not destroy us, but made us much stronger and innovative by adopting digital transformation in all our research and training programs. The participants of the conference, which brought together high-level policymakers, researchers, economists, academics, and non-state actors agreed on the urgent need for lasting solutions to boost Africa's economies. Reporting for viewers Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Giambo 
in Sacramento, California. The East African community has proposed extending the deadline again for a single currency to 2031. This follows the failure of member states to implement the protocol which calls for the use of a single currency by 2024. Moses Javier Rimana reports from Arusha, Tanzania. <laughs> This is the East African Community Anthem during the celebration marking 23 years since the community was revived after its collapse in 1977. However, seven member states of the East African Community have still not implemented the laws and protocols including the call for a monetary union. The measure was signed in November 2013 with a deadline set for 2024. Peter Matuki is the East African Community Secretary General. There's a lot of push for from the citizens of East Africa, from the business community, that they need a common currency. And if you listen to our leaders recently, they've been pushing for this. So it is our commitment that we are going to put in place this process of uh, having common currency almost immediately with the view to have this common currency working, possibly in the next three years maximum. Since the signing of the Monetary Union Protocol by the East African Community Heads of State Summit nine years ago, no institution has yet been put in place. And the regional technocrats have proposed the Council of Ministers to extend the deadline until 2031. Ezekiel Nibigira is the Burundi Minister for East African Affairs and the Chairman of the Council of Ministers. Reaching the monetary union, it requires a number of steps. The council is working hard so that we reach every milestone we have. But you understand that in our community, we have to go together, we have to work together. Each step we have to make, we need to sit down and uh, have a compromise on every step we have to make. The monetary union is the third pillar of the East African Committee's integration process after the customs union and the common market protocol. Experts in the region say that the monetary union faces uphill struggle for adoption. The protocol is expected to heighten an era of fiscal and financial integration and build the necessities required by the partner states to maintain the macroeconomic convergence criteria, which most of the partner states are yet to meet. George Odong is the East African Legislative Assembly lawmaker from Uganda. There has been really a lot of time spent on, uh, on certain decisions, uh, protracted discussions around uh, those very important uh, decisions that usually delay the implementation of our commitments. For as long as we continue with the idea that everybody must be on board and also to just get held hostage by narrow uh, national interests, then we fail the objective of our regional integration. Many development experts welcome a monetary union and the use of one currency to boost the intra-regional trade. Moses Javiarimana, VOA Africa, Arusha, Tanzania. The president of the Chad Bar Association says the country's lawyers are calling for the release of the over 600 people arrested following the deadly October 20 protest, demanding the military honor its 2021 commitment to return the country to democracy. The trial of 400 of the arrested persons should have taken place on Tuesday this week at the high security prison of Koro Toro. Bar Association President Girangi Lega Dioro says everything about the arrests and detention violates all the rules of justice. He tells me that among the reasons for the lawyers' protest is what he calls the illegal deportation of the accused outside of Unjamina, the capital, where they were arrested and then taken to the remote Koro Toro prison, accessible only by airplane and with no mobile phone access. We, as uh, the Chad Bar Association, have uh, decided to protest against the hearing which is uh, being held in uh, Korotoro. Korotoro is this locality with uh, no other human presence. We have denounced the following violation of law. First, it's the deportation by the administrative authority of arrested persons outside the place of the alleged commission of offenses and without a warrant from a judge. That is the first thing. The second is Violation of the rules regulating police custody, that's the Gardavi. In particular, its uh, duration 
thus making detention illegal and arbitrary. The third one is that the heading of, on the minutes, the process verbal, later following a mission involving the president of the court, prosecutors, investigating judge, and the judicial police, without respect of the right of defense, therefore without a lawyer and in violation of the criminal procedure code. Another reason is the denial of uh, the right of defense to those arrested and uh, deported because it is difficult for lawyers to go to this locality. So it would be a parody of justice because in everything is in violation of all the rules of procedure. And therefore, we as lawyers cannot endorse this. That's why we say the arrested person must be just free. I will come back to what you just said. So let me ask, what yeah. happened to the trial? The trial was supposed to begin on Tuesday. Has it started? I don't know. I am not able to say yes or no because, you know, in this locality, as I said before, this locality, Korotoro, it's not possible to talk to someone through mobile phone. They have only used this military radio, the one they call it VHF. It's the only way to talk to someone in this area. Did you also complain that the authorities were not helping you to defend these uh, defendants? And what sort of help were you looking for from the authorities? As I said, you cannot reach this area without uh, a good security. Even judge, for them to reach this area, they took airplane to reach to fire, and then from fire, they take a car or I don't know. But it's not easy for us as lawyers to reach this area without a good security. You know what we are trying to do as lawyers, as a general association, we just try to help these people. They are not able to pay a lawyer to come to this area to defend. So we organize ourselves as a bar association to give them this support. As a lawyers, we are defending everything concerning human rights. So if they can take them to Jamena, we will be present to tell the judge that these people, you, can, you have just to free them. These are 400 detainees. Do you think without lawyers, they can get fair trial? That's what they are trying to do because uh, they want to do everything flowing. So they will just make what they want to do in collaboration with uh, the authorities. And then they will come back. They will say, OK, these people have been condemned because he recognized what he has done. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, sir. Jerangi Lage Dioro is the president of the Child Bar Association. You are speaking with us from the capital, Unjamina. It's allowing arms and fighters to stream into the Lake Chad region, bolstering the strength of terrorist groups there. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. The Nigerian leader spoke Tuesday in Abuja to a summit of heads of state from the Lake Chad Basin Commission or LCBC. Buhari called for more vigilance and cooperation among the Commission's six member nations against the increased proliferation of weapons into the Lake Chad Basin. He said weapons meant for the Ukraine war and to combat terrorism in the Sahel are being diverted to West Africa and ending up in the hands of terrorist groups. He didn't specify who was diverting the weapons, but said the development was threatening improved stability in the region, where a multinational joint tax force created by the LCBC has been fighting terror forces for years. The Russian and Ukrainian embassies in Abuja did not respond to calls for comment. The chairman of the Partnership Against Violent Extremism, Jaye Gaskia agrees the war in Ukraine is a threat to security in the African region. The longer this war goes on, the more it opens up for all manner of uh, uh, groups to become entangled with it in one way or the other, uh, if not directly through um, financing and funding, through building solidarity and the rest of that. Uh, so, and the more that becomes a possibility, then the more insurgent groups in the in the Sahel. Uh, to also begin to find um, the theater of war in Ukraine as, as a very good source. Buhari said the multinational forces are planning fresh operations in the region, but noted that military operations must be backed with sustainable development. 
However, the commission has been hit by financial crisis with nearly every member struggling to meet yearly obligations for intervention programs. Nigeria's contribution to the pact has dwindled from about $2.4 million in 2017 to $315,000 in 2021. More than 30 million people in the Lake Chad Basin are affected by fighting and the impacts of climate change. This week, Nigeria's Water Resources Minister, Suleiman Adamu, who is also chairman of the Commission's Council of Ministers, called for more support. Unfortunately, the Commission has been facing financial crisis due to the non-payment of financial contributions and arrears of contributions in line with approved budgets. There's an urgent need to tackle and address this persistent challenge to ensure that the Executive Secretary delivers on its mandate especially in implementing the Lake Chad Basin Emergency Development Program. I would like to use this opportunity to encourage all of you to urgently look into this crucial issue and carry out the needed advocacy in your respective countries. Security analyst Patrick Agbambu blames global economic downturn for the financial problems and says it will have consequences on the fight against terrorism if allowed to continue. Countries around the world, across the world, Currently experiencing a um, financial downturn, and uh, the region is not uh, exempted. Nigeria, particularly, is also experiencing that, and uh, it's going to affect uh, the intensity of um, the execution of the, the war. Gaskia says the Russia Ukraine war is making countries shift their priorities. On Tuesday, President Buhari ceded the leadership of the Lake Chad Basin Commission to Mohamed Idris Debi Itno, the president of the Transitional Military Council of Chad. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. In South Africa, which has the world's largest HIV-positive population, authorities say girls and young women are now the most at-risk demographic, with many having resorted to transactional sex to pay for the bills during COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns. On this World Aids Day today, December 1st, VOA spoke to a former sex worker and visited a clinic that treats adolescent girls and others with HIV. Kate Bartlett reports from Johannesburg, South Africa on efforts to halt the spread. A slender young woman dressed in a crop top plays with her round-cheeked two-year-old daughter. This 31-year-old South African, who does not wish to use her name due to stigma, was a sex worker for more than a decade in Johannesburg's notorious Hillbrow neighborhood. I get angry because men don't want to listen. Then we also get raped when you get raped and then when you realize that you are HIV positive you can get angry more then sometimes it makes me feel sad. In 2020 as she was struggling to make ends meet during COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns a client who refused to use a condom gave her HIV. She only found out she was positive when she was pregnant with her daughter and got tested at a clinic. Fortunately the little girl was born negative. But the young woman, whose own mother and sister both died of AIDS, is far from alone. A UN AIDS survey this year found, since the start of the pandemic, 38% of South African women who sell or trade sex reported a large drop in income, and 5% more sex workers engaged in more frequent condomless sex. Anne Getuku Shongwe is UN AIDS Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa. She says 63% of new infections in Africa are young women and teenage girls. Adolescent girls between the ages of 15 to 24 uh, are representing just about 30%. Um, but women from 24 up to 49 are the remaining, you know, 30, 30%. So in general, this is a really, really high gendered um, epidemic for sure in our region. Key to stopping the scourge of the virus among this demographic is keeping girls in school, she says. COVID-19 induced poverty has worsened the situation as South African unemployment hit a record 35% in March. The UN survey showed 15% more South African women reported using sex work or transactional sex with so-called blessers to make a living. Community health worker Nonshla Shla Mazaleni explains the term. A blesser, it's a, a, it's a old man, older men who are dating young girls and then they give, they give them money 
in exchange of, for sex. The sex worker VOA spoke to quit when she discovered her status. Now an NGO is helping her, her daughter and her three other children to survive. She's also taking daily oral antiretroviral, ARV, pills. South Africa next year plans to roll out new bimonthly injectable ARVs to make prevention and treatment easier. Sister Jenny Marshall is an adolescent HIV nurse at Johannesburg's busy Fit Coppen Clinic, where people are lining up to get HIV tests and receive their ARVs. She's hopeful about the planned rollout of the new injectable drugs, which will mean patients don't have to remember their pills every day. South African girls and young women will reportedly be the first to be given access. I think it will be a game changer. When I speak to the patients, they're looking forward to it. As for the 31-year-old mother, she just hopes she can live a normal life with her children and be the kind of parent she never had. She says she's already teaching the older ones about safe sex. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. Drought in the Horn of Africa is causing hunger to worsen across the region, including in Kenya, where authorities say nearly a million children are acutely malnourished. The failure of a fifth rainy season in a row has authorities and aid groups scrambling to prevent famine. Akma Hussein reports from Wajia County in northern Kenya. At a busy maternal and child health center in the heart of Wajia in northeast Kenya, Hundreds of mothers like Catherine Martin have brought their malnourished children for treatment. Martin says they suffered from the drought which left them with barely enough food for their children. Martin says I brought my child for treatment to this clinic. We don't have enough food. As mothers, we suffer from the drought. The economy is down as well. So we appeal to government for help. Kenya's National Drought Management Authority in November said more than 942,000 children below the age of five were malnourished, along with 134,000 pregnant and lactating mothers. About one quarter of the suffering is in three northeastern counties. Wajia authorities say 16% of the county's children under five are malnourished. Habiba Ali Malim is Wajia County Executive Committee member for health. They are now pushing screening campaigns and training more healthcare workers to detect early cases of malnutrition. We currently trained uh, 134 healthcare workers. They'll be able to uh, to identify uh, those children who are who are uh, malnourished. If we have uh, stabilization centers in six sub-counties. We are admitting those uh, children who are severe malnourished. Kenyan authorities say the record drought has forced nearly four and a half million people to seek food aid. To lessen the impact from drought, government and aid groups have been drilling more boreholes and bringing emergency food. Mahmoud Osman is the emergency response coordinator at Save the Children organization. He says the needs are great. For every scallop we do, we get more malnourished children. In Wajia, we have 191 outreach sites offering uh, nutritional and uh, integrated medical services. We are also protecting livelihoods by providing animal feeds to emaciated livestock. We are also providing cash transfer programs to about 8,000 uh, households across the county. We are doing a lot. But I know this is just a drop of the ocean in the ocean, and it's not enough. Meanwhile, at the health center in Wajia, more mothers arrive in search of treatment for their malnourished children. I'm saying for VO News, Wajia, Kenya. And that's it for this Thursday, December 1st edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for being our guest this morning. For more African.